Well, now I will be discussing medicine question of grand test 180. The medicine question are from <coughs> question number 95 to 119. And I am sure by now you have done all the question. So with this background, look at question number 95. In fact, this question came in need 2017. If you look into this question, it's a grossly incomplete question. But then why we took this question? Because in the exam, you may get a question like this also. So you should be mentally prepared. That's why deliberately this question has been taken. Now this question says a lady is there, young lady. She has deep pigmented areas on the arm and legs, which most likely cause of this thing. Well, let's look into this thing. No other clue has been given. The answer to this question is C. How we came to this answer? This we do by rule of exclusion. As far as SLE is concerned, yes, this is a disease of the young ladies. But here, classically, you get malar rash over the face. And we don't get deep pigmented patch. So this is ruled out. In hypoparathyroid, as such, skin pigmentation or deep pigmentation is usually not a feature. Okay. Addison disease, here most likely it is hyperpigmentation occur. Of course, vitiligo can occur in those who, who are autoimmune, but hyperpigmentation is also a feature. So it's comparatively ruled out. Then if you rule out all other things, this is the one possibility left. The, what are the points which favors? In the question, there's nothing like this thing. The only, only clue is that it is a auto, it is a auto, this is a autoimmune disease. And vitiligo can also be autoimmune. So that's why point goes more in favor of Parishas anemia. But again, I'm saying this is an incomplete question, but at car we have to go by rule out technique. Now, question number 60, 96. Patient has developed severe pain chest, acute MI, and he was given thrombolytic therapy, and now CPK is increased. This is a classical feature due to reperfusion injury. Now, let's learn the basic concept. What do you mean by reperfusion injury? OK. Well, before I discuss reperfusion injury, let me, let me discuss concept of myocardium salvage and concept of reperfusion therapy. Concept of myocardium salvage. and reperfusion therapy. <clears throat> the concept goes, let's learn the basic concept. The basic concept goes like this. This is a coronary artery. This is a myocardium. <clears throat> Here is a plaque. And if I ask you, stop the video, write down the answer. <clears throat> I have a question for you. Question is, what is the best way to diagnose angina? Options are history, ECG, cardiac enzymes, or echocardiography. Write down the answer. Well, I am sure you have written the answer. The answer is history. Why history? Why not others? In angina, ECG may be normal. Enzymes are normal. Enzymes are raised only in acute MI. And echo is, is usually normal in angina. <coughs> Then what, are, what the typical history we get? History what we get is exertional pain chest. What's the basic concept about exertional pain chest? Let's learn the basic pathology. Well, the, my, this is the heart rate is 70. Plaque is there. Blood is coming like this. Patient is in the resting state. Amount of blood supply and need is balanced. Patient has no problem. Now, patient go for exertion. That means he walks. 
as we know very well, when he will walk, the heart rate will increase 90, 100, 120, maybe 126, heart rate has gone. Now, we also know very well, more the heart rate, more the heart rate, more is the oxygen demand. So now demand is more. Supply cannot be increased because there's a fixed obstruction is there. And demand cannot be met, so now there is tissue ischemia. And patient will have pain chest and hica, and that is a squeezing pain chest. And that's why we best diagnose by exertional pain chest. Okay? Now, as a patient will have pain chest, he will stop. Now, as he stop, heart rate again come back to 70. Demand supply are met, he is comfortably no problem. <clears throat> now, one day a clot comes here, maybe due to rupture of this plaque, or maybe thrombus or embolic phenomena comes. And that lead to complete blockage of the artery. Okay, T total blood supply is gone. And what you get in ECG? Again, stop the video, write down the answer. For the first finding that you get in acute MI soon after the blockage, write down the answer. Well, I'm sure you have written the answer by now. The answer, this is a normal recording. The first, this is T wave. The first finding is Tall, tall T wave, tall T wave. And this is seen in within minutes of acute MI. Okay? So we start getting that means acute MI has occurred. But remember, total artery is blocked. There's no blood supply. But this myocardium is still viable. It is viable means it is alive. It has its own blood supply or it gets blood from some nearby tissues. And now, after three hours, what you get in ECG is ST segment elevation. This is ST segment elevation. That indicate that about three to four hours have passed. Okay? But myocardium is still viable. And if I can open this block, which is blocked here, I can reperfuse the myocardium and I can save the entire myocardium. Got it? But if you do not open a block, then this start, the myocardial tissue will start dying and death will occur from center to periphery. And now, a very frequently asked question, what is the basic pathology of this necrosis? Write down the answer. Well, I'm sure you have written the answer. Answer is coagulative necrosis. This question comes every alternate year. Coagulative necrosis occur. So patient will stuck and that the tissue will die from center to periphery, ultimately myocardial infarction occur. What I want to the convey the message is up to the stage of tall T wave and up to the stage of ST segment elevation, myocardium is alive, and we should try to reperfuse the myocardium. But what are the later findings? Let me discuss ECG finding later on. You get T wave inversion. This is T inversion. Downward arrow means inversion, upward arrow is elevation. This occurs in 8 to 12 hours. And still later on, what you get is Q wave. Q wave is old, and this occurs in 1 to 2 days. This is the ECG finding, we get it. Now, how to reperfuse the myocardium? We can reperfuse the myocardium by thrombolytic therapy, so called drug, any thrombolytic therapy, like streptokinase, TPA. Second is mechanical way. Mechanical way is to do, do PTCA so-called angioplasty. And we can also put stent. They are the mechanical method of reperfusion. And finally, surgery, coronary artery bypass graft or coronary artery bypass surgery. What a basic concept about coronary artery bypass surgery. This is the aorta. 
and we know very well that from the root of aorta arises coronary artery. Suppose this coronary artery is blocked here. They take a graph and they unite like this. Now the blood will go like this. This is the basic principle of using coronary artery bypass surgery or graft. Which graft do you take? Best graft is Lima. Lima is left internal memory artery, second is right internal memory artery, then radial artery, and finally long saphenous vein. It's again a very commonly asked question. So there are all the methods of reperfusion therapy. Now when we reperfuse the myocardium, now suddenly of course the tissue was totally ischemic as I told you. And once you reperfuse, maybe PTCA, PTCA is the most commonly used. Okay, when you reperfuse the myocardium and when the ischemic tissue get lot of blood, then they generate certain, uh, they get the, the free radicals. Their free radicals can do some injury, so-called reperfusion injury, and that can, that's one reason which can raise the creatine kinase as given in the question, okay? So, immediately after the reperfusion, after thermolytic therapy, one thing you should always keep in mind is reperfusion injury. But more than that, what is more frequently asked question is regarding reperfusion therapy. I hope you are clear about the concept of myocardium salvage and concept of reperfusion therapy, okay? Now we talk about next question, question number 97. 97, steroid and cyclophosphamide are not useful in which grade? The answer is beyond doubt, it's about D. Why D? D is the answer. Why not? Let's learn the basic concept. The basic concept goes like this. We know very well that in the SLE, kidney involvement is one of the most important pathology. Okay. And in fact, renal failure is one of the among the one of the most common cause of death in SLE. Other common cause is infection also. And this can lead to chronic renal failure, SLE. Now when we talk about grade six, patient has developed, this is nothing but the entire, both the kidneys are totally sclerose. All the nephron are sclerose, they are going to chronic renal failure. And once the kidney is totally renal failure, totally sclerose, there's no point in giving any immunosuppressive therapy, okay? That means all the tissues are dead. In, in a short way, I can say there's no point in giving steroid or cyclophosphamide. That's why in grade six, they are not effective at all. Now I have a question for you. When, whenever the kidneys are, patient has CRF like in SLE, kidneys are bilaterally shrunken and contracted. It's a diagnostic, and this you can see by ultrasound. So if you are getting any, in any patient, especially in the predisposing factor like SLE, if kidneys are totally shrunken and contracted, there's no point in doing any biopsy also. It's a full proven that is a case of CRF. Now I have a question for you. Stop the video after listing the question and write down the answer. But, but I told you just now, bilateral shrunken kidney is a diagnostic of CRF. But there are a few conditions where patient can have CRF with enlarged kidney size. Write down the answer. What are the causes of CRF with enlarged kidney size? Well, I'm sure you've written the answer. Answer is, answer the question is diabetes, multiple myeloma, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, amyloidosis, and bilateral hydronephrosis.
is a very frequently asked question. The kidneys have a large kidney size, CRM with a large kidney size. Okay, the 97, the answer is D. Now we talk about 98. Okay, Reiter disease, just learn about Reiter disease. But anyway, 98, the answer is A. Now, what is Zeta disease? It's a disease exclusively of the young males. And this one disease, it can occur in epidemic form. It's a very commonly asked question. Why? Why this can happen? Because this can happen in two ways. One is by sexual route. And other is it can occur by the dysentery also. When it occurs with dysentery, the most common organism is Shigella. When it occurs with sexual root, it is by Campylobacter. Campylobacter. Now, what are the classical findings that in this case you get, patient get urethral discharge. Patient can have conjunctivitis. And patient usually has monoarticular pain. Single joint and knee joint is the most commonly asked joint involved. OK, so in this case, what else can be there? Dactylitis can be there. There can be. Keratoderma bellonorragica. They are nothing but scales over the palm and sole. And we can go also get circinate bellonitis. So all the features of this disease. Option A is symmetrical simultaneous polyarthritis is never a feature. And in fact, symmetrical arthritis is usually feature seen in rheumatoid arthritis. It's not a feature. I told you there's only usually one joint, uh, which is the knee joint is involved in treater's disease. The best answer on 98 is A. 99, <coughs> again, this again a question from need only. Not a very good question, but again, you don't, you can't tell in the need people. A 40 year lady, swelling and stiffness of DIP, nail have some pitting yellowness. Okay, skin and scalp are normal. Well, whenever we get a condition like DIP with nail involvement, one of the classical thing that you should always come in your mind is psoriasis. That's fine. But what the point which is going against psoriasis in this case is skin is normal. Skin scalp is normal. There is, that means there is no skin involvement in there. If skin involvement was there, then there is no doubt about it. Then we can very surely can think about psoriatic arthritis. But what the clue, point to be noted, one thing not known to most of students, nail involvement may precede skin involvement in some cases. Okay, that point has to be kept in mind. Now, point going in favor again, the point I, but I told you is DIP and nail involvement. What now a question for you? Stop the video, write down the answer. What type of nail abnormality we get in psoriasis? Well, I'm sure you have written the answer. Answer is you get so called pitting nails, which is given in the question also. Okay, but what we call as tumbling nail. Now DIP is involved in this condition. Now again, one more question for you. Tell me in which condition DIP is classically not involved. Stop the video, write down the answer. Well, the answer of this condition is rheumatoid arthritis. 
in RA, DIP is never involved. <clears throat> and one more question for you, <clears throat> rank number one question. In rheumatoid arthritis, primarily it tend to involve the peripheral joint. <clears throat> the only part of vertebra which is involved is cervical spine. It is involved in RA. Lumbar vertebra is never involved. That's why backache is never a symptom of rheumatoid arthritis. And just to remind you, backache is one of the most important symptoms of ankylosing spondylitis. Okay. So now we come to the next question, question number 100. Answer of question number 100 is <clears throat> B. Okay. Well, most common symptom of ADP, KD, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Let's learn about it. It's a, it's a this one disease which can manifest as chronic renal failure. This one condition where kidneys are bilaterally enlarged. They are bilaterally palpable and bilateral. In the previous question of SLE, I discussed cause of enlarged kidney. <clears throat> but not they are not as enlarged that they are palpable and palatable. This is the condition where we get this problem. And this patient usually has hematuria. Hypertension is a feature. And <clears throat> patient can have many extra renal manifestation. And the most common is hepatic cysts. Then colonic diverticulosis. Here I like to add something. If you read 12th edition of Harrison and you read 15th edition of Harrison, there he writes the most common extra renal feature is diverticulosis. Okay, in fact, this question had come in 2007 also in on the PG exam, that time it used to be on the PG. So answer was diverticulosis. But subsequent edition, if you read, if you read uh, 19 edition or 20 edition, they say the most common extra renal manifested is hepatic cyst. Hence, this is the best answer. It is my duty to tell you, because there are some changes, there are some mistake in Harrison also. It is one of the mistakes that even previously also, in, when in the 15th edition it was mentioned that the most common feature is diverticulosis. All other books they used to talk about hepatic cyst. Okay, but now of course the doubt is clear, hepatic cyst is the most common extra-renal feature. What else can happen? What are seen? Berry and rhythm are seen in this patient. And that can lead to, of course, that can lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay. And uh, MVP can be a feature. Cyst can occur in other places, in the, especially in the abdomen. Cyst can occur in spleen, pancreas, very uncommonly in lungs, but never in brain. Okay. So how to remember this, the cyst can occur in abdominal structure, it is very uncommon in the lung, very uncommon, and never in brain. Question 101. Answer is C. Okay, let me discuss this question. Well, uh, we talk about oliguria. Oliguria is urine output less than 400 ml per day is oliguria. It is one of the most common feature in acute renal failure, right? It is there in around more than 80 percent cases. This is a true statement? No, it's not a true statement. It is there in around 19, it is there in 99 percent when we say 80 percent means we are talking about 81, 82, 83, it's, this is not a correct statement, is in around 99 percent cases. But can it be something polyuria with ARF? 
write down the answer. My question is, can there be acute renal failure with urine output more than 400 ml? What is that condition known as? Write down the answer. But that condition where the urine output is more than 400 ml, but still ARF, that is known as non-oliguric, non-oliguric renal failure. This is classically occurs in those conditions where we have rhabdomyolysis. That means muscle necrosis has occurred and that creates large amount of urea and creatinine. So even suddenly large amount of urea creatinine has been produced. Even 1000 ml of the urine is not good enough to throw out all the waste. The waste is retained in the body that lead to a type of non oliguric renal failure. But it's a very rare condition. But that's why I said in more than 99% cases, the classical feature of ARF is oliguria. Okay. B is intrinsic renal failure is the most common cause? No, it is always the dehydration, which is the most common cause of ARF. Now, what about, what about recovery phase of ARF? This you need to discuss. I told you, patient come to you with oliguria, and this stay for some time. And after some time, patient develop puriuria. Again, this point is not known to most of students. So why polyuria occurs? This you will never understand unless you know the basic pathology. So let's learn the basic concept of ARF. Then I'll tell you why oliguria is followed by polyuria. For that, I told you pathology. This is a normal tubule. And here is the lining of the lining of tubules. And when ARF occurs, so-called acute, we call as ARF, we call what call as acute tubular necrosis. And this tubular necrosis occurs due to dehydration. What happened? This same, this become like this. These cells get broken down and they are thrown into these tubular lumen. Now, these tubular lumen have been blocked by these cells which are broken and urine cannot come out. Patient goes into oliguric phase. But in the due course of time, <coughs> scavenger cells, they remove all these debris. And again, the cells regenerate. They again like this. But in the initial phase of recovery, these cells, though anatomically they are present, but physiologically they are not active. And I hope you remember very well, the tubular cells are primarily concerned with reabsorption. 180 liter is being formed of the urine is filtered per, per day. 178 liter is reabsorbed by tubules and the interstitium. Since the tubule cells are being made, but still they are not very active functionally, more and more urine goes out. And, and of course the root is clear now, the patient goes into polyuria. So that's why patients start with oliguria and patients go into polyuria. Now what's the difference in the management? In oliguric phase, we restrict the fluid intake. We restrict potassium intake. We restrict sodium intake. Everything we restrict. But in polyuria phase, you have to give lot of fluid, lot of potassium, you have to give lot of uh, other supplement also. So I hope things are clear to you. Okay? So, 101 answer is C. Question number 102. 102, the answer to this question is C. We get a lady, 26 year, week, 26 year men, we got four day history of weakness, lower liver limb, and patient has denied any trauma. Okay, but he had fever and absence of reflexes. This history goes in favor of Gulen Barre syndrome. GBS, what they call us, 
some people pronounce is gulen bare syndrome some people pronounce gian bare syndrome some people say gillen bare syndrome where well, different pronunciations are there so i am saying i am saying gbs <coughs> well what are the point going in favor is in gian bare syndrome patient has preceding history of fever sore throat maybe diarrhea and the most common cause is campylobacter jejuni this you don't have to forget it's very very important question and the classical presentation is a reflexia flaccid paralysis okay flaccid paralysis and treatment of this acute and of course this is ascending type of paralysis we have to be very very watchful about this patient because as the weakness extend upward it's a type of ascending paralysis it may involve the diaphragm and that can lead to respiratory arrest that's why the patient of gbs should always be managed in intensive care unit where we have facility for a ventilator okay and the treatment of choice is plasma pheresis or intravenous immunoglobulin but what the most important point you should remember in this giabare syndrome corticosteroid have got no role to play it's not a treatment of choice at all okay <coughs> so i hope things are clear to you question number 103 neurocystic sarcosis the answer of is all are true except answer is c well we know very well that neurocystic sarcosis is a very important parasite of cns and the most common site in parasite in the is in the cns is brain and this one thing it can calcify and once that we have a calcify focus in the brain that become a source of seizures forever because you can it's not a single uh, calcified spot multiple spots are there and that can generate seizures all the time so hence uh, when you are look into this option 103 contrast in nct show a ring enhancing lesion yes most common parasitic lesion of cns yes parenchymal brain calcification is rare it is a very common feature and new onset partial seizure is the most common manifestation yes is, is the most common manifestation so by rule out technique c is the best answer now let little, little, little bit extra now calcification occur let later on in the initial stage we get ring enhancing lesion okay how to treat this case you first give dexamethasone then you give albendazole okay now why you want to give dexa first albendazole because suppose you give albendazole suppose there are multiple cysts are there they will rupture and they lead to increase intracranial pressure so we don't want any raise icp which has its own complication so first we give dexamethasone so that it prevents the rise of uh, intracranial pressure suddenly due to start of albendazole question 104 we get a 56 year male no medication and fatigue and he has jaundice and if you look into his lft lft is bilirubin is 7 out of that is direct is 5 that means it has got more of a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia enzymes sgot sgpt are only mildly raised 35 and alp is highly raised 720 now this picture goes in favor of obstructive jaundice point in favor are conjugated hyperbilirubinemia and very high level of alp sgot sgpt are raised when parenchyma is involved 
But when you obstructive jaundice, ALP is raised. Now, whenever we are suspecting any obstructive jaundice, the first investigation should be always ultrasound. Okay. Now, the, the, if I talk about obstructive jaundice, two actual most common clinical situation where we get obstructive jaundice is gallstones and carcinoma, head of pancreas. They are the most two practical problems that we get. Now I have a question for you. Stop the video. I got one patient. <clears throat> he has obstructive jaundice. And I got, uh, I don't, I got no road to a report of ultrasound. Ultrasound not done. But I got five or six, his report of LFT in the last one month. By looking into LFT only, only LFT, liver function test, how will you say that is a case of gallstone or carcinoma head of pancreas? Write down the answer, stop the video. Well, I'm sure you have written the answer. Answer is that in gallstone, you get fluctuating jaundice. That means bilirubin rise, fall, rise, fall, rise, fall, rise, fall. But in case of carcinoma head of pancreas, it is always increasing like this. But the basic, why this happened, let's learn the basic concept. The basic concept is that here is the common bile duct, which come from liver and gall, uh, gall bladder. It comes and it opens in the second part of duodenum. And this opening is known as ampulla of water. And here is the head of pancreas. Now suppose the gallstone is here. It gives you obstructive picture. But due to pressure, this gallstone may shift. Now it has come to this place. When that, it shifts, definitely the road is cleared. Jaundice comes down. Again, blockage occurs. Again, traffic jam. So what I can say, it is just like you stand in a red light. In, ka, in a red light crossing, you stand. Uh, when red light is there, traffic is jammed. When the green light come, everything cleared up again. Same thing, but I can say. But in contrast, in carcinoma head open chaos, this duct is con always blocked. That's why you the continuous rise of bilirubin in contrast to fluctuating jaundice in, in, in a gallbladder stone. Okay? The answer is 104 is A. Liver biopsy has no role to do in any case of gallstone. Review of peripheral smear will not get any especially good results. We are not getting any deca, this thing. ERCP you do in, in ERCP you do classically in case of primary sclerosing cholangitis, where the ERCP is the most important investigation. But that is a very rare cause of, rare cause of obstructive jaundice. And we never go for uh, ERCP, the first investigation in any case of, in any case of uh, obstructive jaundice. Ultrasound is always the first and the best initial investigation. Well, 105, which is a, which infection can lead to malabsorption syndrome? GRDS is the straightforward question which can lead to malabsorption syndrome. Amoebiasis lead to amoebiasis lead to diarrhea. Okay, it's, it's usually not a cause of, and amoebiasis is usually intend to involve the large intestine. It's not a cause of malabsorption. Malabsorption means there is some problem in the small intestine. Similarly, escherichia and hookworm they don't lead to uh, malabsorption. Hookworm can lead to bleeding. That can lead to iron deficiency anemia. But that's not, that lead to bleeding. But it's not a cause of so-called absorption process normal. Absorption process is hampered only in case of GRDS. Hence, uh, what D is the best answer in this case. Question 106 is a beautiful question. This question came in neat exam. This is calciphylaxis. And this entity is seen exclusively in chronic renal failure. 
Now, what is the basic pathophysiology of calcifolysis? Let us learn the basic concept. This is the artery and it is supplying the muscle in the skin. Now, in Sierra, the, this wall of artery is calcified because of metastatic calcification. And that lead to obliteration of the lumen of the artery and that lead to extensive skin necrosis as you have seen in the picture also. And that lead to so-called calciphylaxis. This is seen exclusively in CRF. Okay. One more thing that happened in CRF is fibrosing dermopathy. What is this? There is flexor contracture of skin overlying the elbow joint and knee joint. Just imagine like this, his uh, this flex, uh, flexor muscle, muscle skin get contracted, his arm are like this. Same thing, you can flex your knees right now, okay and you flex your arm also. Now, skin overlying the flexor side is contracted. It cannot extend total fibro skin. So, he is in the position as I told you, flex knee and flex arm, so called uh, flex uh, fibrosing dermopathy. Is it? There are two things are classically seen in chronic renal failure. Okay? So, I hope things are clear to you. Question 107. We are getting urine finding. You can see just we are getting muddy brown urine cast. Muddy brown cast is seen in acute tubular necrosis or acute renal failure. RBC cast is seen in acute glomerulonephritis. WBC cast is seen in acute pyelonephritis and broadcast, broad vex, vexy cast, it is seen in chronic renal failure. Which cast can be a normal finding? Normal finding is highline cast and granular cast they are normal finding. So, answer this question is ARF. Question 108, answer is D. Okay. Patient has acute red, uh, red eye, fever, facial nerve palsy and this is nothing but a type of Hereford syndrome which is nothing but a type of acute sarcoidosis. Okay. Lofgren syndrome is also a type of acute pericardial sarcoidosis, but here they have erythema nodosum. And what the finding, what is given is all about D, that is Herford syndrome. Can it be mumps? In mumps, you don't get facial nerve palsy. You don't get red eyes. Can we get Ramsey-Hunt syndrome? In Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, there can be seven ter, but there is also some vesicles are there. Uh, and in that case, pattern enlargement is not a feature. So by rule out technique also, we can say it's a more of a case of uh, D is the best answer. Now, extra thing that we see in a case of chronic sarcoidosis. Chronic sarcoidosis, one of the classical feature is bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy in the chest. There can be facial nerve palsy. In fact, facial nerve palsy is the most common finding in chronic sarcoidosis. Hypercalcemia occurs. Increase ACE level occurs. Montu's test is negative. And when you do bronchoalveolar lavage, CD4, CD8 ratio 
in bronco alvar lavage is uh, more than 3 to 5. We also do gallium scan to diagnose sarcoidosis, but the most accurate test is biopsy. Here you get non caseating granoma. Treatment of sarcoidosis is corticosteroids. Question 109. 56 year lady, bedicarizia, rigidity, and mask like face. It is straightforward. I think this is true. Too simple question is Parkinsonism. Okay? Because Alzheimer disease has a dementia, memory loss is a feature. Bedicarinosis is not a feature. Then ALS, <coughs> that is America, they say amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is nothing but type of motor neuron disease. Is ALS. There they have feature of only weak motor feature, uh, nothing like bedicarinosia. Kudfeld Jacob disease, disease again type of prion disease, dementia is a feature, nothing is this. This is straightforward is Parkinsonism is a feature. Okay. Well, what are the causes of Parkinson? Elderly people idiopathy. It can be can be caused by so many drugs which are anti dopaminergic drug. they can lead to a Parkinson. Now I have a question for you. Tell me which electrolyte or which element can cause Parkinson? Write down the answer. Answer this question is copper. That's why we can see Wilson disease. In Wilson disease, there is excess of copper in the body that can lead to, that can lead to Parkinson-like feature. Now I quote a line from Nelson's pediatric book. Well, I told you Parkinson is a disease of an elderly person, spiky idiopathic variety, which is usually a disease of about 50, 60 years. But what Nelson write is standard line. Suppose you get a one, uh, one person below 20 years, and he has a feature of Parkinson-like feature. You should always investigate for Wilson disease. Now I have a question for you. Stop the video, write down the answer. Suppose you are sitting in the OPD and you get a child, just a child of 12 years. Pediatric OPD, you are sitting and he has got feature of Parkinson and you just learned one line. This could be a case of Parkinson. What is the first initial thing you would like to do for this patient? Write down the answer. Well, I'm sure you have written the answer. Answer is send the patient to your eye specialist and he will do slit lamp examination and he will like to see for ring. Over the upper and low part of the cornea and there is an excess of copper deposited in the desmet membrane and that will strongly favor that patient has got Parkinson. But now one more question. If you really want to confirm the most accurate test to diagnose Wilson disease is liver biopsy. Look for the copper content in the liver biopsy piece is the most accurate test. Question 110. CT scan before doing the lumbar puncture. Well, one thing is there. Any lumbar puncture, whatever reason it may be, lumbar puncture should never be done if the rays intracranial pressure is there. Never do it. Because if you do lumbar puncture in a, with the raised ICP, there will be coning uh, of the cerebellum into the foramen magnum. What do you mean by this? This is the skull. Okay, and this is the spinal cord. And this is the foramen magnum. Here is the cerebrum and here is the cerebellum. 
if you do LP, fluid will go out and this may cone into the foramen magnum and uh, the patient will die soon because of coning, right? That's why it's a mandatory that before you do LP, CT scan, non-contrast CT scan should be done to rule out raised ICP. If raised ICP is there, you first give injection mannitol. Reduce the, uh, bring the uh, pressure, intracranial pressure to normal so that the coning of cerebral tonsil does not occur. Now look into this option that we have. History of brain tumor and stroke, that means there is a full chance of having raised ICP. Glasgow comma scale of less than 10, that again may indicate raised ICP. Signs of raised ICT straight forward. So seizure before three months of presentation is the only thing where we can think that perhaps there is no raised ICP. Out of all these four options, B is the best answer. The 110 answer is B Bombay. Question 111, uh, 111 is a uh, lumbar puncture is being done. And one of the, uh, again, a simple question. If you, you just think very quietly, where does the CSF flow? CSF flow, this is the spinal cord. This is the pia. This is arachnoid. This is dura. Then muscle skin. Skin, muscle, dura, arachnoid, pia, and the spinal cord. So when we do the lumbar puncture, what we do? We put a needle and we put a needle and bring it into subarachnoid space where, where CSF is flowing. I don't need to tell to this uh, illustrious person watching this video the CSF flow in the sub arachnoid space. And subarachnoid space lies between arachnoid and pia. So definitely we want to collect CSF, we have to come up to this only. So we will be piercing dura arachnoid and we will never be piercing the pia matter because if you cross pia matter that means you are entering into the spinal cord itself and you are going to damage spinal cord, no way. So I hope, I don't think I need to give more explanation on this question that why Question on 111 is D, the best answer. Okay. Question 112. Here we, the answer is D, Delhi. This can be part of autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome where not only high, uh, not only parathyroid problem is there, patient also has has feature of other endocrine feature like thyroid disorder, Edison disease, type 1 diabetes also. Okay. In hyperparathyroid patients usually manifest with adenoma and other feature. That's why in such cases you should investigate for other endocrine disorder also as I mentioned. Thyroid disorders, type 1 diabetes, Edison disease. Question 113. Indication of blood transfusion R. Answer is D. In fact, in all the uh, other condition, blood transfusion should be done. Okay. Be very careful. The question is, indication of blood transfusion are all except, and except means none. If you accept and none remove, that means indication. You can ask this way also. Indication or blood transfusion are A, B, and C, all other indication. Now shock, of course, that means patient is having blood loss. Now when we talk about shock, that means systolic BP is less than 90. So we presume that he's talking about shock due to bleeding. Now, one more thing you got to know. For a case of shock due to any, GI, any bleed, maybe GI bleed or maybe roadside accident, if they ask you what is the best replacement fluid, they'll always talk about best. Then answer should be always blood. 
blood for blood is the rule khoon ka badla khoon se is easy to remember it okay other options are patient having blood loss hb below 10 or stop bleeding but hb below 7 these are gate indicate of blood transfusion but i like to discuss something called shock index this very frequently is a favorite question of the AMC exam, shock index. What is this? Pulse, systolic BP. Suppose you happen to see one patient, normal person, his pulse is 70 and systolic BP is 140. Ratio of pulse to systolic BP will be 0.5. Now suppose he has got GI bleed, and as GI bleed will happen, his systolic BP comes down. And we also know that in reciprocation pulse goes high. Now ratio becomes 0.75. More bleeding, 100, 100, 1. More bleeding, 90, 120, 1.25. More bleeding, 70, 140. So what we find as, as more and more hemorrhage going on, bleeding going on, pulse, this shock index is increasing. The shock index is a very good parameter to know about hypovolemia, particularly in case of due to any bleeding. But now there is one more question. Now they talk about modified shock index. In fact, this question came in Ames, May 2015. And this came in May 2016 AIM exam. In modified shock index, the parameter but take, we don't take systolic BP, we take mean arterial pressure, rest all remain the same. The shock index and modified shock index are useful in investigation finding in case of any shock, hypovolume shock, but in particular due to any bleeding. Well, 114, the answer is B. The hypermanesemia, it manifests with bradycardia uh, and hypotension. Okay. Just to inform you, in raised intracranial pressure, there is bradycardia, decreased heart rate, increased blood pressure. Okay. This point should be very, very clear to you. Bradycardia, but remember, in case of hypovolemic shock, you get tachycardia with low BP. I just mentioned, <clears throat> I just mentioned to you, in, cardio <coughs> in cardiogenic shock, again, increase heart rate, decrease BP. But now I have a question for you. Stop the video, write down the answer. The, we can get, in, even in acute MI, we can get bradycardia with hypotension. This occur in which type of acute MI? Write down the answer. Well, this classically occur in inferior wall MI, especially if there is involvement of right ventricular infarction also. Inferior wall MI can lead to bradycardia. And we know very well that right coronary artery supply is inferior wall as well as the right ventricle. If right ventricle infarction is there, then patient can have hypotension also. In this case, raised JVP is there. I have another question for you. Stop the video, write down the answer. We got one patient or RV infarction with decreased BP and raised JVP and I want to raise the blood pressure, what is the best treatment of this hypotension? Well, I'm sure you have written the answer. Answer is give normal saline. You give normal saline to raise the BP in this condition. It's a very frequently asked question. Let's talk about question number 115. of action of ticagrol is, it is, a type of 
antiplatelet drug which is a p2 y12 antagonist answer is c okay now which drug is which inhibits cyclooxygenase it is aspirin which is a gp2b3a receptor antagonist epsiximab Tarofiban, Eptafibadide, okay, question number 116, answer is E. First of all, what do you mean by non-erosive arthritis? Erosive, erosive means deformity of the joint. Non-erosive means where you do not get any deformity. Patient has joint pains, and when the pain settles down, there is complete normalcy of the joint. There is no joint uh, abnormalities there. Now, very frequently asked question from orthopedic. What are the important cause of non-erosive arthritis? The non-erosive arthritis is seen in rheumatic fever. We all know in rheumatic fever, large joints are involved. And this patient has severe pain. But when the pain disappears, that joint becomes normal. Number two, non-erosive is also seen in SLE. Non-erosive is also seen in Bechet syndrome is also seen in Whipple disease. In all these conditions, you get non erosive arthritis. Question 117. The answer is B. Digital gangrene is a classical feature that is seen in PAN. Other features favoring are hypertension. In this case, BP is 170 by 110. Okay. All peripheral pulses are palpable. Okay. Because palpable are palpable. That means it's not a case of Takaya shoes. And ANCA is negative. ANCA negative means Wegener is ruled out. ANCA is negative. Wegener is ruled out. Right. And in Hinox-Nolin purpura, hinox purpura, hypertension is not a feature. And disseminated tuberculosis does not present with digital gangrene and hypertension. And PAN, so PAN is a feature. Now, very, very important question. In PAN, polyartitis nodosa, hypertension is a feature, but Renal artery stenosis is not a feature. Now I have a question for you. Tell me any corrective tissue disorder where hypertension is a feature as well as renal artery stenosis is a feature. Stop the video, write down the answer. Well, I'm sure you've written the answer by now. The answer is Takayashu disease. In tuck ISU, hypertension and rheumatoid uh, and renal artery stenosis both are seen. But pan it is not seen. But one more thing, uh, that uh, tuck ISU is a disease of the young ladies. In our question, it is a young male is there. That point again should be kept in the mind. Question 118. Pain chest is there for last 24 hours. What you will not do in this case? you will not give streptokinase. Why? In the, one of the previous questions, I told you regarding reperfusion therapy. And I told you, if we reperfuse the myocardium, OK, reperfuse the myocardium. Now I have a very simple question for you. Stop the video, write down the answer. By now, you learn the concept of myocardium salvage, concept of reperfusion, which I discussed in one of the previous questions. Now, very simple question. You are sitting in the emergency ward, a patient comes with acute MI, and you want to give thrombolytic therapy. What time you should thrombolyze the patient? Option A, you do immediately. 
option do you do after 30 minutes option c you do after 3 hours after 12 hours what is the best time you like to thermalize write down the answer well the best answer is immediately 3 hours is the most common wrong answer point to be noted the patient come with acute mi you do thermalize immediately why to wait for time up to three hour you do, you can save the myocardium from infarction. If the question was like this, if you want to save so that no necrosis occur, it should be thermalized up to what time? Then the answer is three hours. Now, up to 12 hour, if you thermalize, there's some benefit of thermalysis. But after 12 hour, every tissue is dead. There's no point in doing thermolytic therapy. Hence, the question is, Teptokan is the best answer. Aspirin, what about role of aspirin? In fact, one more question, very frequently asked question from Ames. Acute MI patient come to you. What the first treatment you give is always aspirin. Why it is the best answer? Low-dose aspirin, because and once you give aspirin, now before that, in acute MI, 25% people, they do not reach hospital, they die before reaching hospital. Under 25%, they die within the first 24 hours. It means mortality in acute MI is 50%. Now, if you use aspirin in, as a, an early intervention, it reduces mortality by 30%. 30% is a huge benefit. Hence, aspirin should always be given in a case of acute MI whenever patient come to you. Morphine you will give to reduce the pain as patient is still having pain and statin has got long term benefit by reducing lipid. Cheptokinase is, is good, a very good drug, but time is late, time is already gone. It is already 24 hours, there is no point in giving Cheptokinase. Hence, Cheptokinase is the best answer. The last question is, which sign is, is Shamro's sign? This is seen in clubbing. Clubbing is there. Important cause of clubbing are, it could be cyanotic, congenital heart diseases, it may occur in bronchiectasis, it may occur in carcinoma lungs, and the huge list is there. But whenever this question comes, Clubbing is not a feature of tuberculosis. It's a very, very important point. Okay, it's very uncommon or rare feature uh, clubbing is in this case. Okay, so this was all what I had to discuss in a limited time because when we are doing test and discussion like this, at least grand test discussion, you have to, uh, you have to see 300 questions and we have a limitation of time that you also understand. But still, I tried my level best to give you as much information as possible. Just to inform you, I have recorded all my lectures in Medicine e -Gurukul. You can see in DBMCI app, Medicine e -Gurukul. Ultimate, fully updated from 20th edition of Harrison. Lot of free lectures are there in our DBMCI YouTube channel. See them, and if you like it, then you can subscribe for Medicine e -Gurukul by Dr. Mukesh Bhatia. I hope in a limited time of this Grand discussion, you learned a lot. Thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you very much.